We're going to read out of 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 this morning. And if you would look with me at 1 Thessalonians, I'd love you to read along with me. I, I try to say this every Sunday because I really think it's important that you read the text that you become familiar with your Bibles and that you're actually reading what God has preserved for us to hear from Him. I want you to really catch hold of the reality that when we read the Scripture together, we are reading God's message to us. Yes, this was Paul writing to the Thessalonians, but what God has preserved is a message about himself that is crucial for our lives right here. And so when I encourage each Sunday to read along, I'm not wanting you to do that for any other reason except that I want you to hear what the Lord has to say and read it for yourself and know where you can find what he has said to you. All right? And so we're going to dig into this passage in 1 Thessalonians 4. I want you to read along with me. If you have your Bible, you can start at the very far end of your Bible in Revelation and flip to the left a little bit and you'll find 1 Thessalonians along the way. If you're in the Pew Bible, do the same thing. Start at the right, at the end of the Bible, then look for page about 160 or so. You'll find 1 Thessalonians 4. Now, I want to remind you that 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 began the uh, section of the letter that's focusing on this term sanctification. You heard Kurt mention that earlier. Sanctification is this encouragement for us to live our lives in a way that we walk and please God as we wait for Jesus and we do it more and more as our life unfolds and so God is encouraging us in chapter 4 to be a people who are waiting for Jesus properly who are waiting for him better and better the longer we live that's the idea of sanctification And here we get to this passage today in chapter 4, and I just want to give you fair warning before we get here and start reading this. This is a difficult passage. The the tone of the passage is encouragement. And I've just been praying and hoping that the tone of the passage of encouragement is not overshadowed by the subject of the passage, which is grief because of people who die. This is not going to be an easy sermon. This is not the sermon you necessarily want to preach to make everybody feel happy. We're going to be talking about grief, and it's difficult. And it's going to be particularly difficult for me because I'm going to be very honest about some grief in my own life. And my sister's here today, which makes it even more difficult to say some of the things that uh, are going to represent some emotional... See, I looked at her, and that was not good. (laughs) Some emotional things in my life. Grief is tough. And we're just going to dive in today, and we're going to see what God has to say to us, because God has a word for us right here that addresses some of the most difficult times in life when we're grieving. I wish that all of us could be strangers to grief, but the truth is we are all acquainted with grief. I mean, when I was younger, about 16, this is the biggest, most significant first experience of grief for me. I lost my granddad. And it was at a real critical time of my life. And I'll never forget going up at the end of the funeral service when they had the open casket and walking by that casket and not being able to leave the edge of that casket. I mean, my life felt like in some ways it was falling apart. And my grandfather for me was like this stable encouragement that I needed. And he was gone. And I remember gripping the edge of that casket and not wanting to leave that moment because I was so sad he was gone. And I've lost all my grandparents. I've walked with Lindley through losing all of her grandparents. In 1998, Lindley and I lost a child. It was during Thanksgiving. I'm telling you, that makes for a challenging Thanksgiving holiday. In 2001, my mom died, 57 years old. Now, I used to think that was really old. Not anymore. Not anymore. 
And there's not a Mother's Day that goes by that I'm not sad. She loved my birthday and Angie's birthday. She always made the biggest deal out of it. And no matter how good my birthday goes, there's always a tinge of sorrow. I still have those moments sometimes when I'm just sitting there doing something totally unrelated to my mom and all of a sudden, it'll just pop in my mind, man, I wish I could hear her say one more time, I love you. I mean, I'm acquainted with grief and so are you. I've buried some of your children. I've buried some of your parents. I've buried some of your grandparents. I've buried some of your best friends. And I've buried some people in this church that I miss so much. They were my close friends. And I'm just so grateful that God cares about our grief. And he has something to say to us. And if we'll hear what God has to say, it really will make all the difference in our grief. And the truth is, the longer that every one of us live, the more we will see death and have to deal with the grief from death. This is a valuable word from God to us. So let's read it together. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Let's start in verse 13. We do not want you to be uninformed or ignorant. Brothers, concerning those who have fallen asleep, so that you might not grieve as the rest of those not having hope. First thing that the Lord is saying to us here is that He doesn't want us to be uninformed regarding grief related to death. So that when we grieve, we would not grieve over those who have died like those who have no hope. So He wants us to grieve with an informed grief. A grief that has hope. Now I want to make some, some clarifications about the term fallen asleep because I don't want you to be mistaken about what the Bible teaches regarding death for those who believe in Jesus Christ. The Bible teaches, and this term fallen asleep should be understood, that when we die in Christ, we are immediately with the Lord. There is no state where we are not with the Lord when we die. We don't taste death. We are immediately with the Lord. But this idea of being asleep carries with it the fact that we have not yet received our resurrected bodies. The bodies we're going to have for all of eternity, we've not received because the resurrection of the dead has not occurred. But because the resurrection of the dead has not occurred, that does not mean that we are not with the Lord. We are with the Lord in a bodily recognizable state that is prior to receiving our resurrected body. What I want you to get from this primarily is don't misunderstand the term asleep as not being cognitive of the Lord's presence. You are with the Lord when you die. That's what the Bible teaches. That's what's represented by the term sleep. It's just that we are prior to receiving our final bodily state in perfection. So you're with the Lord even though you are dead. All right, so make sure we're clear on that one. Now, there is a non-negotiable foundational truth if we are going to have hope from what God says to us. If, if we're going to have hope when we read the rest of these verses in what God says in regard to grief related to people dying in our lives, there is a non-negotiable truth we have to embrace. 
If you don't embrace this truth, you will not find hope in what I'm going to tell you. It's found in verse 14. Verse 14 says, If we believe that Jesus died and rose again, in the same way God also will bring those who have fallen asleep through Jesus with Jesus. The foundational, non-negotiable truth is that Jesus Christ has died and rose again. If we believe that Jesus Christ has overcome death, then we will find hope in the words of God right here to us related to our grief when people die. Another way to understand this, this non-negotiable truth is found in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. You can look there later, verses 12 and following. You can see that what Paul says there is, he says, if the resurrection from the dead for those who believe in Christ is not real, then the resurrection of Jesus Christ is not real. In other words, the resurrection of Jesus Christ cannot be separated from the reality that those in Christ will also be raised from the dead. If you don't believe in the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, you will not find hope in these words. But if you do believe in the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, these words will make all the difference because the resurrection of of the dead is inseparably tied to the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So hope in grief is possible only when we believe in the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. And when we believe in that truth, then we know that God has said here, that those who have died in Christ will be brought back to life just like Jesus was brought back to life. I want you to see what else he says here that gives us reasons for our hope. Verse 15. For this we are saying to you by the word of the Lord that we who are still alive at the coming of the Lord will not go before those who are dead, those who are asleep. Because the Lord himself, with a great shout of command, in the voice of an archangel, in the trumpet of God, will come down from heaven, and the dead in Christ will be raised first. Then we who are still alive will at once be caught up with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And then we will always be with the Lord. That's why we can have hope in the face of grief that comes when people around us die. Because God raised Jesus Christ from the dead, he will most assuredly raise those who have placed their faith in Christ, who have died, and they will not be at any disadvantage from those who are still alive in Christ. In fact, they will precede those still alive to meet with the Lord, to come with the Lord, and then we will meet with them, and we will all be with the Lord forever. We have reason to have great hope in our grief such that we grieve an informed grief that is different from those who grieve who have no hope. So what we're being told here is that our grief in the face of death Because of these reasons, based on the fundamental non-negotiable truth of Jesus Christ's resurrection, that means that our grief should be different from those who grieve, who do not believe these things. Okay, so what does different mean? Do you you ever feel like that, that sometimes when you are grieving over the death of someone you love that it's not very Christian to be sad do you you ever 
feel like that? I mean, I wonder if sometimes we don't misunderstand this concept of informed grief to think that different means less grief or less intense grief or grief with a smile. You know, there's a really in, in telling comment that Paul makes in Philippians chapter 2, verses 25 through 27. It talks, Paul's talking about one of his friends, Epaphroditus. And Epaphroditus is ill to the point of dying. And Paul says that God had mercy on Epaphroditus because God healed Epaphroditus. So he didn't end up dying, but he was ill to the point of death. What's really interesting is Paul says God also had mercy on him because when he spared Epaphroditus from dying, he spared Paul from having sorrow upon sorrow at his friend's death. Paul said, I would have been broken hearted if Epaphras had died and God had mercy on me by keeping me from grief upon grief. Now think about this. Paul knew that if Epaphroditus died as a believer in Jesus Christ, it would be to his gain, right? He knew for Epaphroditus to die would be great because Epaphroditus would be with the Lord. Paul also knew that someday he would see Epaphroditus again. Paul knew that. Paul knew that Epaphroditus was no longer in pain from his illness, but would be with the Lord, which is much better. Paul knew everything he should know to grieve like those who have hope. And yet he says, if he'd have died, he'd have had sorrow upon sorrow. That's not the only place the scripture talks about the sorrow of death for believers who have hope. Acts chapter 8 verse 2 talks about when Stephen died. You know what it says about the believers there? It says that the believers mourned greatly. I want you to understand this morning that grieving differently than those who do not have hope does not mean that you will grieve any less it does not mean that if you are depressed or sad or grieving over the death of a loved one that you are somehow less mature in your faith because of the sadness that you feel. I want you to understand that different does not necessarily mean less. In fact, it could perhaps mean more. What is the distinguishing mark for believers? How are people supposed to know we follow Christ? How we love each other. If we are able by the Spirit of God and the power of God to love each other at a level that represents and is fueled by the very love of God, is it hard to fathom that our love would be so intense for another believer that the loss of them in this life would be overwhelming in grief? See, different because of hope does not mean it's somehow no longer grief. Grief is still grief, even with hope. And I would propose to you that there are times perhaps when it's even greater because of our relationship with Christ. So what makes informed grief different? Have you ever been to an amusement park and you get in one of those little cars they got with your kids or anything and you get in there and they're all excited to drive? And they, you know, they, they're tall enough to fit in the seatbelt and they actually get to drive and they think this is going to be incredible, I get to drive. And they get in there and they grab the steering wheel and you start going down and they're turning the wheel this way and all of a sudden the car goes that way and they look at you like, what happened? I'm not driving. And you'd be like, yeah, you're not driving, it's pretend, you're on a track, you're just, and it's like, it's a total ripoff. They thought I was actually driving, and now they hate that ride, they never want to do it again because they've been deceived, you know? You ever been on that situation? Well, well grief is like that car. 
we get into the car of grief and we actually believe we're in control. But when you're overwhelmed with grief because you've lost somebody that you love, I can promise you, you are less in control than you think you are. Grief is a controlling element of your life. When you're overwhelmed with grief, you feel out of control. And you can try to steer that car, but I promise you, it's not going to go where you want it to go. It's going to go wherever you end up because of what you believe. Here's what informed grief is. You're in that car of grief, and the tracks of that car, when you are dealing with informed grief, grief with hope, on the basis of Christ's resurrection, the tracks of that car actually lead towards motivating you to trust in Jesus. If you have uninformed grief, grief with no hope, you don't believe in the resurrection of Jesus. You don't believe in Jesus coming again and raising everybody from the dead and getting everybody trusting him to be with him forever. You don't believe that. Then the tracks of that grief lead you to further unbelief. If there's a God and he allowed this to happen, I don't want anything to do with him. I mean, you've heard things like that. Uninformed grief, like those who do not believe, without hope, will lead you further away from the Lord. But informed grief, though incredibly intense and overwhelming, though it rips your heart apart, will always lead you to trust the Lord more. When my mom died in 2001, I was broken, and I still mourn her loss. But guess what? Informed grief means I don't grieve any less it means that I trust the Lord more. Because the only way I will see her again is if I trust in the God who sent Christ, who overcame death, and will someday bring us together again. That is my hope. And that informed grief keeps me on a path of trusting Christ more. Informed grief motivates your faith in uninformed grief immobilizes your faith. The difference is not the intensity of your grief. The difference is where your grief takes you. And informed grief always takes you to Jesus Christ more and more and more. That's why right in the middle of dealing with sanctification, the Lord speaks about grief. Because there are some pathways that lead us to Christ better and faster than other pathways, and grief is one of those pathways. But it's got to be informed grief. See, we believe that if a believer dies, that we will one day see them again because of what Christ has promised. And our grief is informed with that truth, and we trust Christ more. That's what makes us different. We trust Christ. What about the person that we love that did not believe in Jesus Christ and died? The Bible teaches that the person who does not believe in Jesus Christ in this lifetime and dies outside of faith in Christ will spend an eternity suffering, separated from God. I've done funerals for people who were not believers in Jesus Christ. They're very hard. See, when you lose somebody that you love, that you know was not a believer in Jesus Christ, you got to ask the question, what's informing my grief in that situation? I mean, Thessalonians, they, they knew people that did not trust Christ. Their family members did not trust Christ. They would see them die. What would inform their grief in that situation? What, what about when a baby or a child dies before that child is able to make a decision to trust in Jesus Christ? The Bible is just not as clear as I'd like the Bible to be on that issue. 
I would like for the Bible to have a verse or four that clearly stated every child that dies before being able to accept Jesus Christ as Savior will be in heaven forever. I wish the Bible said that. But there is no verse in the Bible that says that. Now I believe that the Bible gives me more than adequate reason to have every element of hope that the child we lost in 1998, we will meet in heaven. I believe the Bible gives me ample reason to believe that, but the Bible is not clear on that issue like I want it to be. So what's really informing my hope there? I mean, you can think of a million examples of situations and circumstances that fall into exceptions and situations that demand where is the verse that addresses that issue? Where is all this is saying is if someone is in Christ and they die, I'm going to be with them forever. But what about the person that's not in Christ that dies that I love with the love of Christ? What about that child that I don't know if they accepted Christ or even able to accept Christ? What about them? What about this? What about that? I mean, what's informing our grief in those situations? I mean, isn't that the question we need to answer? Look at verse 17. Very last phrase. Thus, we will always be with the Lord. That is what informs our grief. Because someday, Jesus Christ is going to come again and we will be with him forever. And he tells us that he will wipe away every tear and there will be no more mourning and there will be no more sorrow and there will be no more pain. You know what that does to my grief? It informs my grief and it tells me that when Jesus comes again, no matter what the circumstance, no matter what the grief related to death or anything else, that being with Jesus answers every question. And he so works in perfecting everything that there is not even an ounce of grief left in my heart for everything that has been and everything that will be. It's the presence of Jesus Christ that informs our grief at every step that enables us to grieve like those who have hope no matter what. It all rests upon whether or not you believe in the resurrection of Jesus. Because unless you believe that he is the son of God who overcame sin and death, none of this will encourage you. But if you believe that truth, You have every reason to believe he is capable of making every wrong right and erasing every element of grief from our life on this earth, no matter what it is. What informs my grief? Jesus Christ and Jesus alone. And then the Lord encourages us in the last verse of this section, verse 18, encourage each other with these words. I've been around grief and all of you long enough to know and I've dealt with grief in my own life enough to know that grief has a tendency to cause us to choose isolation. And God in his grace commanded us, don't let grief isolate you. That's where the enemy will deceive you and put you on the track of unbelief. You need to encourage each other. 
in your grief. So I just want to tell you, if you're grieving today, or when you grieve in the future, because we all will, please obey the Lord and seek out encouragement. You cannot do grief well alone because you're not meant to. Otherwise, God would not have commanded us to encourage each other. If you're not in the middle of grief today, then I encourage you to get your hands a little dirty and reach out to somebody who's grieving because they can't do it alone. And you need that situation as much as they do. We need to encourage each other with the words of Jesus by getting involved in each other's lives at our saddest moments. Recently, I had a conversation with a lady in our church, and she said to me, she just lost her sister. And she said to me, I said, how are you doing? She said, I'm doing pretty good. You could hear in her voice the grief. She said, I had a conversation with my sister before she died, and my sister said to me, I'm ready. I'm ready. And this lady told me when she heard her sister say that to her, that everything all of a sudden was okay. She felt hope. And it's helping her in her grief. You, you know what those words, I'm ready, really summarize? Everything that God just said to us in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Jesus is coming again. And those who die in Christ will not be disadvantaged. They're coming with him. And those who are still alive are going to be caught up with all of them, and we will all be with the Lord forever. Informed grief is always better. We're going to grieve. Let's make sure we do it in the Lord. And let's make sure we encourage each other. Because when it's all said and done, I can promise you this, not a one of us who trust in the Lord will be disappointed that we did.